Hey yo, what's up, Jay Lee? Nigga, what's cracking? And what you doing? What's going on? What's happening? <laughs> Nowadays, I'm pimping the mat and selling cracking. Nigga, you still rapping? What up, this? I hang with the hardest. Hey yo, what up? This is Dope DoD. I'm Skits Vicious with my boys Jay Reaper and Dr. Diggles over there. Yeah. And we in the studio with Lions Events, baby. Let's get this shit cracking. Yeah, um, growing up in Holland um, and growing up the way uh, we did, um, you know, I think we've, we've had a lot of cultural influence from, from many different places and, and situations through our families. You know, we're all, we all come from a broken home. Uh, we all come from moving around and, and uh, you know, like me and Reap, we got, our mothers are from Africa, so we grew up bilingual. Uh, that was a huge influence on us as far as our taste in music and, uh, you know, skills in language. You don't often see, you know, rappers coming from the Netherlands and being respected by, you know, the legends that we grew up to listening to and even having a chance to work with. So, um, you know, for me, the major influence in my youth was, um, as far as growing up in Holland, it's very multicultural. Um, and yeah, being bilingual, you know, uh, gave me an opportunity at an early age to, you know, think outside of the box and think outside of the borders that we were uh, confined by, so to speak, musically. So that's a little piece of me. <laughs> well, I mean, for me, basically growing up, I moved around a lot. So I've been, uh, I've been living in Africa. I've been living in uh, Germany. I've been living in Holland. My fam live out in uh, England, so like Skit said, we got influences from all around the world. And from a young age, I was already, you know, thinking about doing things bigger than, you know, just in Holland or just in Germany or whatever. So, um, I mean, growing up, uh, and I mean, growing up with, with my man's right here, basically, he was my uh, my hip hop uh, teacher, basically. He did teach you. He was the one that taught me everything about hardcore hip-hop and from that point on yeah we just clicked and i think basically dope dod was already born back then and uh, we started making some hardcore shit ourselves trying to do you know the same shit yeah that's like when we was like 15 years old yeah. when we had just moved back to holland from germany and um we were like 15 or some shit and like reap said i was like Hip hop was my religion. <laughs> Still is. It was basically so, the hip hop guru of. Uh, yeah, literally, of like you know, I'd I'd be with with all my homies kicking it, whether you know outside playing basketball or just blazing somewhere, and uh, you know, just relentlessly listening to it. like you know that was kind of like our study of of the rap that we wanted to become good at, and it just so happened just before that I used to kick it with Dopey already, and. Um, Jay came into the picture maybe like two years after and um, yeah he quickly developed you know an interest into wanting to rap to make beats as well and Jay's brother Peter Songolo who's responsible for many classics uh, like productions like Psychosis and Red Rum and, and that type mm -hmm. of shit he was also kind of on board already working on his beats and um, it wasn't long before we decided fuck it man we've got to join the team and uh, Dope D.O.D. was born shortly after. And there's many stories, man. <laughs> it goes back like to yeah. chilling with uh, with Andres Fouché, mm -hmm. Anton van der Linde, Ruben van der Linde, Walker Pachler. You know, these guys were also at the heart of, uh, of you know, our video universe, so to speak. And, um, you know, it was just a team of young kids with a dream, knowing how how good we were and we're going to get and where it would take us to, you know. So it was just a matter of time before the world knew. Yep, yep. I joined the crew a little later. I um, grew up in different places. I started as a you know, skateboard kid, listening to rock music, Limp Bizkit, and all that sort of stuff. Even had some guitar lessons and shit. Drum kid in the basement. And um, I always was interested in parties, and then I started DJing. And then uh, I met Skits first. At, uh, we was doing uh, at college. Yeah, yeah, we were doing the like same a... shit. Yeah, and, and I've worked uh, with all groups there and then I heard there she was like oh shit I, I want to be a part of this whatever man if it takes an arm and a leg here you go you can have it man this is a straight fire then we did the the, the first video that that uh Dope Duty, Double Jeopardy yeah that was the first one we did 
We shot it at the previous, uh, one of my previous cribs. Yep. Yep, yep. Long time ago. Yeah, Diggy was there early too. Man. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, uh, yeah, and as you mentioned, a lot of the videos we shot were usually somewhere connected to the places that he resided at. Mm. These usually being like, like squatter. Yeah, like like yeah. you know, abandoned buildings that they reintroduce as a residence. And, uh, you know, this usually creates a very fruitful ground for, you know, artists, hippies, smokers. <laughs> Everybody gets together and yeah, gets yeah, creative yeah, in them yeah, shit. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where Double Jeopardy was shot back in the day in another neighborhood. And right now mm -hmm. we're in the new studio, which is uh, built by Diggles and Civil Unrest. <coughs> and they have an, a producer alias named Jungle Dynamite. We'll get into that later. But, um, yeah, yeah. yep, that's basically where the new base is at right here, baby. Mm-hmm. Foundation. influence me damn the devil <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> um um well as i mentioned earlier first of all growing up bilingual you know you catch a lot of influences and and, and inspiration from in, in this case you know my my well actually first language being english you know, I, I used to listen to uh, a lot of the rock my dad used to listen to. He used to show me all the classic yeah. Grindhouse, B-movie flicks, you know, the Aliens, the Terminators, the Hellraisers, whatever. And um, I used to read a lot of comic books. And all that combined with growing up in an urban environment in the city, you know, you're bound to, you know, be on the corner somewhere with your friends and being introduced into hip-hop and when i was a kid i wasn't sure whether i was going to be an artist as far as you know uh painting or drawing or whether i was going to get into movies maybe as an actor or a director and then as you know as i, I right around the years that i start going to high school that's when hip-hop i really started understanding it i remember watching hip-hop videos with my auntie when i was way younger than that but i couldn't even understand what the fuck it was you know like buster rhymes and shit i'd be like what kind of alien crazy again comic creature is this you know i see especially the rappers that i was inspired by uh, had a lot of you know influence too from from creating an alias creating a character larger than life the slim shadies the red mans you know and um the Wu Tang Clan. So, um, yeah, you know that that all together kind of inspired me. Like, damn, hip hop actually captures that entire package in one. I can work on my videos. I can fuck around and and act if I feel like it. I can put my own emotions and inspiration into my music and basically create that <coughs> larger than life character. You know that y'all came to love. So. That's uh, and I think you know that was a long explanation. So I think about <laughs> if 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 I talk for for my man Reap right here, I think it's very close because those passions brought us together as well. You know, so that's us all in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I would say for me, um, musically, when it comes down to hip hop, I mean, I grew up you know listening to rock music as well. My dad, he's a huge Rolling Stone fan, um, Jimi Hendrix. So I grew up listening to shit like that. And of course, like Bemba and Tonga music, which is uh, the native music in Africa uh, where my mom uh, comes from. Um, so I had all these different types of influence, but mainly in hip hop, what really inspired me to start, you know, like doing it the same way was uh, probably Black Moon. I gotta say Black Moon from the boot camp click. Yeah, Buckshot, Buckshot BDI. He, he probably influenced my whole style as, you know, as a soul MC, like that's the one artist I gotta like point out, like yeah, that's the one that really made me want to do this shit. That's Black Moon. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a million MCs I can mention. Yeah, exactly. For, for me, it's, it's basically I love like hip hop crews, you know, like like groups. I got into uh, like I said, I used to be a rock kid. Got into uh, like the Beastie Boys because they they just sort of half rock hip hop thing. And like the Wu Tang Clan, and like the, the like old Squatch, you know, like Tribe yeah. Called Quest. Yeah, I mean, indeed, uh, as Diggy mentions, that's that's something you know you can find in in our group as well, exactly, especially yeah. uh, you know coming up with Dopey. It, you mm -hmm. basically had a had a flavor to everyone's liking, you know, and I think that indeed it creates 
uh, attention or or something exciting or to dynamic, listen to. Exactly, yeah, yeah, dynamic, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So hell yeah, man. Hip hop crews. That's uh, you know Smith and Wesson, uh, Cypress Hill, that type of shit. You know, duos, crews, is what created the duo right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the real one? Ah. Damn, I gotta say, probably, um, I remember, because this was, uh, I didn't even Which know, I, I didn't even know about this artist back then, but uh, I think it was my brother, my older brother, he got a, a, a Wu-Tang Forever CD back then. And that's when I started to find out about Wu-Tang. This was way before I met Skits even. <clears throat> and I was intrigued, like, what the fuck, like, what the fuck is this kind of crazy shit, like... This is like straight up some kung fu, like you know, yeah, kung yeah. fu movie shit, but then translated into music. So I think yeah, Wu Tang Forever. That was probably the first CD I owned. But the real first CD I ever bought was uh, Black Moon. Enter the stage. That was the first one I actually got in the record store. Shit, I'm trying. I'm trying to think back. You know, as a youngster, like. As I said, growing up listening to you, to a lot of the shit my dad put me on to, it, it must have been like a Golden Earring CD or some shit like that, you know, like, for those yeah, that probably, don't know, yeah, Golden yeah. Earring are like, you know, uh, the most legendary rock band to ever come from Holland with yeah. major accolades and, and great songs. And as a youngster, I used to love their shit. I used to, you know, look up to them. I used to try and be Barry Hay in the mirror, basically, you know, so I think... As a youngster, I used to go to the record shops with my dad, you know, I probably tapped him on the show, mm -hmm. like, I want that greatest yeah, hit CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then yeah. the first single that I ever owned, like, back in junior, shit, it must, I think it must have been The Offspring or some shit I like do. that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty fly what, for a white I guy. I was about to say, my, mine is The Offspring. And uh, it was classic, it was my birthday, and my uncle asked me, like, yo, what, what CDs do you want to have? What gift do you want to have? Yeah, I want CDs or some shit. Yeah, what CDs? I want The Offspring, uh, Limp Bizkit. Yeah, you had, like, a little uh, list as a young Yeah, yeah, yeah like, exactly, uh, like a list, and he could just pick. But he bought me all the albums. What's the one, Freestyler? What's their name Ooh, again? Funk MCs. Bomb, Bomb, Bomb Funk MCs. MC. It's either one of those. It's The Offspring <laughs> or Bomb Funk MCs or something terribly commercially pushed, you know, that all the youngsters used to rock out to you <laughs> yeah. back in junior, yeah. Yeah. But that was the best gift. I got the, the Beastie Boys album, the, the Osprey and Limp Bizkit. Mm. Yeah. That was the best. Yeah, as soon as, as soon as, <laughs> right when I left junior, like when I was 12, 13, and I was about to go to high school, that's when I started digging the crates for, you know, all the hip hop classics. Like Reap said, I went to, to the, enter the 36 chamber, yeah, then I yeah, dug yeah, into yeah, the yeah. Temples of Boom, then, uh, you know, you get into the All We Got Is Us, and the Dare Is A Dark Sides, and that type of shit, you know, yeah. Both insane. It was for, for, uh, can, can I say this yeah, one? <laughs> for me, it was insane because I used to be a big Limp Bizkit fan. Like I had all the records, original and shit, and uh, I didn't check them for like, I don't know ten years or whatever. And then uh, we we uh, pop off with what happened, and then we get the phone call like, "Yo, you want to open up for Limp Bizkit at uh, Amsterdam at a, at a show in Amsterdam?" He was no, like, "No, no, it was a show in Dusseldorf." No, that was the first show we did with them on tour. Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. the first... Yeah, you know, I think the invite was oh, in Holland. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Not even, wasn't was it even in Groningen, maybe? No, 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 no that's something else. Mm -hmm. We skipped on an Everlast support show to get on tour with the Biscuit. That was yeah. it. That's another... <laughs> but, uh... uh like I was saying, like we got the phone calls, like, do you want to open up for Limp Bizkit? I'm like, what the fuck? These fuckers still alive? They're still rocking it? Is it? Hell the fuck, yeah, we want to do it. And then family we, boy. And then we get the phone call from uh, from Fred Durst himself saying he loves what happened, and that he wants us not just to, to uh, open up that one gig, but to do like the whole European tour with him. And we was like fresh off the bat. We just released the the Evil EP, like before Branded. This was before we dropped Branded and shit. And yeah. then we got on the road with them, and it was it was a madhouse, man. We came from rocking clubs, like we we we, we was. For us, at our highest peak, like, we like we just did the release party for the Evil EP. It was sold out. We were kings of the town, and then the next day we had to go on tour with Limp Bizkit to rock like ten, fifteen thousand people crowd. Yeah, like, you didn't know huge. what to do on that stage. Like, huge, <laughs> like, just fucking stadiums. Around. Like, hey, yo, where the fuck you at? Like, 
huge. Yeah, crazy, crazy. Uh, eternal love to Limbiscuit, man, for like, you know, taking Definitely, us under yeah. their wing and schooling us, you know, mm -hmm. to uh, to how to deal with that type of shit, how to do a, a proper performance, and, and yeah, even inviting us out on stage to rock and together now with them, the Method Man classic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They taught us how to be rock stars, man, definitely. Like, Fred Durst sat down uh, with us, like, after each show and said, yeah, you can, like, if Well, they, I wouldn't necessarily crowd... say he taught us oh, well. how to be rock stars, but he definitely <laughs> taught us how the game works mm. in order to maintain being a rock star. Yeah. Absolutely. I was born a fucking rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave me hanging, bro. <laughs> I mean, we, like I said earlier, uh, we basically, I mean, like when I met Skits uh, back in high school, he basically started teaching me about all these fucking hip hop, uh, you know, groups and crews and shit I didn't know about. So it first started out like we wanted to be like them, so we started to make some hardcore shit ourselves. We just had shit like, uh, um, I think way back it was even uh, some, some wacky ass fucking uh, uh, producer program. Uh, like Magic's, Magic's music. Magic music making. Yeah, yeah I, I think it was Magic's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like some bullshit, you know, they had some <laughs> fucking loops in there and shit. You just fucking, you know, copy paste that mm -hmm. shit. But still, like, we had a little bit of our own touch. We felt like, you know, damn, I can, you know, I can do something with this music shit. Because it feels like, you know, I'm chopping up little bits and starting to make my own shit. And then it just developed. I started working with uh, um, Acid. Is yeah, it Acid, Acid right? Pro, yes. Acid Pro, I think it's a mm -hmm. music program by Sony. A lot of people don't know. These motherfuckers made some dope beats as well. Yeah, yeah. if you ain't yeah. got a beat maker, you got to start making it yourself <laughs> first. <laughs> yep. And, and we, basically, driving, we basically started making underground albums and shit, you know? So back then it already started out, you know, us developing like a certain style, a certain, you know, dark style inspired by shit like There's a Dark Side by Red Man. And we just started, you know, making shit and just fucking developed more and more. And eventually we just fucking realized, like, we got to do this shit, like, in a big studio. We got to do, do this shit on a professional level. Yeah, I remember our first demo album, so to speak. It was kind of like a little album, but no, you know, official release or, or anything like that. No mixing, no mastering, but just the tracks we made. And remember, I think on the second we... we already advanced as far as getting sample packs and, and like drum kits and that type of shit. Yeah. But on the first album, we just sampled snares and and little samples from existing hip hop tracks. Yeah. <laughs> so you're basically <laughs> sampling shit that's already been sampled. And probably if you hear it now, it's going to sound terrible. I, re I remember, <laughs> shout out Gaja Puppy, homeboy from us, who's also from the city. I remember we, we had a performance with with us and Kranchi Puppy at this bar somewhere outside of town. It's called Side Lad and the spot. Crane ah, yeah, used to I hang there. The story, yeah. And I remember what, that's actually when I got the proof that our album would never work <laughs> if you would want to do it live. <laughs> Because one of those beats was blasting over the speakers there. And you literally could hear no definition of it. It was just like this soup. Just <laughs> mixing all together and not sounding, you know, like anything like a beat. <laughs> but it was fun nevertheless. I'm happy that was the only live performance we did with that album. <laughs> uh. Yeah, if for the fans, if you want to do, if you want to listen to some beats, like, Skitch, you made most of the beats on the Fountain of Death album. That's right? true, yeah. If you do a little deep dive digging into the dark web, you will find it somewhere. Yes, Jay had one beat on there <laughs> and one feature. Yeah. And a lot of people, this is, let me clear this up for any D&D fans watching this. A lot of people thought because Double Jeopardy and Insane were released before what happened, Jay wasn't in the group yet. But if you pay attention, first of all, on Jay the Fountain of Death... Uh, on the mixtape, Jay has a feature and a production, and he's in the videos as well, both Double Jeopardy and Insane. So I ain't left off. It was <laughs> I ain't left off. No, but it was it was just a project me and Dopey was doing for fun at the time, basically saying we got some free time on our hands. Let's just do a Dopey Rotten Skits Vicious tape. But yeah. before that, me, Dopey, and Jay had already been making the the album that I spoke of that sounded so terrible at the bar was already made uh, back then. So. <laughs> Yeah, Dope D.O.D. was already a group then. 
Go check that out though. It's dope underground shit, especially insane. It's like a like a no, show. You can see the, that yeah, you can see man. the skills from our yeah. boys that would do the videos for us in years after. That's the second video we ever did. It's like a little short movie. Yeah. yeah. Better than any movie released by Dutch directors and actors. That wasn't a shot. The truth. <laughs> No, it wasn't. Nah, never. I mean, we grew up uh, bilingual and basically, you know, I mean, English was our first language. So naturally, we just, you know, always did this shit. You know, yeah, it's English. funny, too, because a lot of people around us that were rapping in Dutch and the fact you used to have a scene back in the day in, in all the countries in Europe, because, you know, the standard was American. So the language was English. Everybody was trying to rap in English. But yeah, of course, people that don't speak the language naturally they sound like shit so you know a lot of people decided fuck it we got to start rapping in our own language so by the time we caught up you know there'd already been a, a prospering dutch rapping scene for for 10 years at least and um you know a lot of people were like ah you know what happens to people that rap in english what are you gonna do with that nobody you know nobody gets famous in holland with english rap and we were thinking well <laughs> Holland isn't our sole goal, so, so you know. The world is a lot bigger than Holland. Exactly, the world is yours if you, uh, if you know what the fuck you're doing. Well, I never had a job. I, I maybe had a job that lasted me two weeks as a teenager, like at a supermarket or at a factory. Imagine but, skits working for the boss. <laughs> but, you know, like... I mean, an actual job that I had to get by without, you know, having a hustle or something that got me through whatever I was doing, never, ever. I'm never going to have a job, not a normal one, not one for a boss. It's funny, I've discussed this often with a lot of my peers and people that, you know, live life the way I do. And I think I told this to Andres Fouché, one of our homies, you know, I think as an artist, it's hard for a lot of people to understand why you do what you do and how you always managing doing it you know because you know parents teachers society they will always try to pressurize you like yeah but you know this is not a real job what are you going to do with this uh, I, you know but i think an artist in the back of his mind if you know what you if you know you have that thing that's needed to do whatever way you're going to get it you don't ever have to worry about that shit you know so to all my artists that are still dreamers pursue word your up. fucking dreams baby word up word up <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually working in a fucking metal factory uh, just before we went on tour with Limp Biscuit. And of course, that work was fucked up and I didn't like it at all. But You almost chopped your finger off there as well, right? And I almost chopped my finger <laughs> off and I had a minor accident. It was turned out major. <laughs> I couldn't work for about four weeks and after that I even quit. And uh, I think it was right after that we got the call from Limp Biscuit to go on tour with him. And that's when my life yeah. basically started, boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I used to have all types of shitty jobs, man. <laughs> Just whatever to, to get that money, like cleaning dishes at this fucking restaurant that I didn't fit in at all. Like, I was the smoker stoner kid, and this was like a posh people restaurant. But it was just one chef that worked there, and at the end of each shift, you would play the end of the 36. Uh, Chambers album on the fucking little boombox we had, and then we had to clean the whole kitchen. And yeah, we would just rap along with that word for word. <laughs> Diggy would take the plates and shit the dishes. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, after that, I became a manager of a nightclub, Simplon, in, in our hometown. We did our first couple of uh, EP releases there, CD releases there, lots of parties. Yeah. Then Dope Dope Do blew the fuck up. And then uh, I was like, yo, I'm in Russia right now. I'm, uh, I'm on tour and I'm going on tour with Korn and this and that. So I, just, I, I had to quit <laughs> quit college, quit job. Fuck, live the life, man. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> Fired because you're on fire. How's that? <laughs> Favorite producers? Oh, right off the top, I can say... Uh, Easy Mo B, it's definitely up there. Uh, I think he did most of the productions on uh, the Ready to Die album by Biggie. Definitely one of the sickest producers. And uh, I was actually uh, bumping some shit yesterday, uh, like Boot Camp and Black Moon and shit we've been talking about. 
uh, all their productions were made by the beat miners, which was like, like a collective of producers. And they had some fucking fire as well. I gotta say, the beat miners probably influenced me as well to start making beats. Mm. Defo, yeah, you can hear that too in your early productions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I think that's beautiful too uh, about hip hop productions. Like, even though to an untrained listener, it might all sound the same or similar. You know, like the the, the certain way a, a producer approaches a beat. He can, you know, he'll like like Reza, like Beat Miners, like Dr. Dre, you know, each one of them, they, they have their own little universe going on with sounds and, and flavors, and that's what I love so much about it. About Yo, we had a camera malfunction, but we're back, so I'm going to try and repeat what I was just saying. Basically saying what I love about rap music is the different regions and places in the world that styles get born from, and, you know trademark a certain sound from a certain area and um no i was just saying that's uh you know i love how that creates uh interesting collaborations between let's say we work with dj paul a three six mafia member you know a pioneer from from the down south and um we work with virus syndicate from from england uh, on some grime shit and uh, what what i love about it is for example when i name uh, a pioneer of you know that what now is called trap and and what the guys did in the uk which is grime i think it's a beautiful thing to see how it evolves and 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 to see all the different flavors that come from it and i just wanted to tell the fans you know um that always get on our case once a beat sounds a little trappy or whatever instead of thinking ah oh, that's trap i don't fuck with that i don't want to listen to it uh dig into it more before you just you know disregard something yeah. over it being a certain genre or a certain style i think you know whatever we try and do we always try to give it a dope dod edge or even if it's not your cliche dope dod edge you know we're always going to try and be innovative with it so i say if you want to expand your knowledge on hip-hop and enjoy more music be more open to different styles it'll get you a long way dig into that shit yeah, yeah. So many, so many different styles and genres that you can, yeah. Boom. Favorite artists? Well, off the top, I'll just name a few from different genres. That would be um, Queen, um, The Prodigy, uh, The Notorious B.I.G., um, Felix Labonte. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix. To name a few, yeah, on my uh, end. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Slow Mo, After One, uh, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash definitely <laughs> gotta put Johnny in there for the dance. <laughs> yeah, Johnny is fucking boss. Uh, I think again that also Cash. stems from I think a lot of people would you know assume rappers only listen to hip-hop you know and that hip-hop is very rebellious towards any type of music form but i i think it's the contrary you know i mm -hmm. think hip-hop stems from sampling and exactly and, and it came from the funk and so like we, exactly we, we put everything in there and that's yeah. what we put in dope dd as well it's like it's not it's just a hip-hop show it's like more when you see like the energy and how rowdy we get on stage is more i feel like it's more like a rock show than just a, a, rock and a hip -hop show man we, we absolutely yeah. We're yeah. kicking the door. Yeah, and I think, I, indeed, I think that's why, you know, the top dogs in the game also never discriminate working together or fucking with each other because, you know, there is no boundary when it comes to music. Good music is good music. Exactly, you know? exactly. And hip hop is universal. It's <laughs> a big question. Um, um, all sorts of shit. I mean, from time to time, I, you know, I listen to some shit, like, from way back, like, uh, I love to listen to uh, John Lennon, for example. Uh, John Lennon's um, Plastic Ono Band. Uh, I think it was released back in the, fuck, 70s, I think. I'm not sure, though, but um, all sorts of shit, man. I listen to, uh, I listen to uh, shit like Kendrick Lamar, uh, shit like uh, 2 Chains.
Travis Scott, um, and old school shit as well. I mean, you know, I think great music never dies. So to me, shit like you know, like putting on a you know a Black Moon album, for example, I can do that shit anytime. You know, uh, putting on some digital underground, for example, Ghetto yeah, Boys yeah. last Ghetto night. Ghetto Boys <laughs> was bumped last night. You know, taking it back and you know realizing like that's music that's timeless. You know, so you can bump that shit any day. Yeah, word. Yeah, if, if I got a rep for some some new shit that's been out recently, last year I, I couldn't get enough of uh, Blank Face from Schoolboy Q. I think it's one of the dopest hip hop albums in a long time. Um, I listened to uh, Skepta Konichiwa, oh, yes. which I also thought was a banger. Um, well, late last year and kind of going into this year, uh, I love the ASAP Mob Cozy tapes. So yeah, that's another thing for those that think rap is dead or, or, you know, that don't even listen to any of the new artists out of a principle, you're missing out, man. Because, uh, like, for example, Snoop Dogg fans, go listen to that album he made with Wiz Khalifa. If you're a smoker, go listen to Wiz Khalifa <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. This dude got some dope fucking shit. So uh, I'm very happy where rap is at, and I'm very happy that I can be inspired, too, by the guys that are my age and are in the game we're in right now, you know, so... More life, baby. Hmm, shit. I, I say like hip hop is, is like the, the more it's more than just a genre, it's a whole lifestyle with the with the you know the the, the, the clothing and the, the the swag and the smoking and shit. It's literally everything. Music to me. is everything to me as <laughs> yeah. well. You know, it's, it's, it's both music yeah. and hip hop, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you could say you could say hip hop is the soundtrack to my life. Definitely. It's like <clears throat> I don't know, you know. It's like the. It's part of, you know. I'm just. I'm just making up the four important elements in life, which is good food, good sex, good movies, and good music, and the fifth would be the conversations you have about all those four elements. <laughs> so, like life, that, baby, life. Yeah. <laughs> Word. Yeah. Well, yeah, after the, the question I just answered, one of them would be Schoolboy Q, for sure. I think he's got a raw style. I love his beats. And I think he would work together with us very well. So that would be one of them. Yep. I always say Rizzo on a beat. That would be dope. Yeah, Rizzo on a fucking album. Yeah, dude. Let's make a movie, <laughs> too, Rizzo. <laughs> Shouts out Ghost, man. Shouts out Wu-Tang. Yeah, shit. Damn. If I gotta name something like outside of the box, I would probably say something really rugged and dirty like Marilyn Manson. I think it would be really crazy, crazy to do a track yeah. with Marilyn Manson. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's another example of a dude that transcends transcends time and, and, and genres, you know. A style of his own. Yeah. I think that's kind of like a, I mean, it's a relative question. Because, I mean, you know, old school. Because now, you know, like mid-90s shit, like shit from 96, 98. To me, um, you know, when I grew up listening to hip-hop, it wasn't old school. But now it would be considered as old school. But to me, old school is really like, you know, the early, the late 80s shit. Like mm -hmm. the hip-hop mm -hmm. that was made in the late yeah. 80s. Grandmaster Flash shit. So actually... Damn, it's hard to pick one, but I would say um, old school because, I mean, that's the foundation. If you know about the old school, you can still build upon that. Yeah, you know where you're heading. <laughs> yeah, you know where you're heading. Yeah. If you don't know, you ain't even going to know what the fuck you do, and that's yep, true. Yep, yep. No, I think, too, you can break it down in, I guess, certain levels, you know, like you could say, like, some shit that's old school you can appreciate for it for being you know whatever it pioneered or or, yeah. or but then some old school shit might have been improved on over the years where you can say wow the way they do exactly, that shit now exactly, but that exactly, you know it's it's not it. fair to compare by saying the old school shit cannot hang because without the right. foundation they wouldn't have been able to develop it either you know mm -hmm. but then without all the technical <laughs> shit <laughs> it's it's definitely a fucking fact the older i get 
and I'm not that old yet, I'm 29, but you know, as, as the years progress, you notice as a human being, you, you appreciate the past more and more, and you appreciate certain shit that just can't be beaten because it was a, at a certain time, a certain mm -hmm. place, a certain way. Exactly. Like, like, exactly. The, like the golden age of rap in yeah, the 80s like and the, the, the 90s, you know, certain artists that like came from so there. So raw, dirty, gun Exactly. So, I mean, at the end, old school will always win because, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's the memories. It's, it's a part of life, you know, uh, for, for any person, I think, you know. And 20 years from now, kids will be like, man, remember... Uh, the what's that Nintendo game that you can move? Yeah, the Nintendo Wii shit. The, remember the Nintendo yeah, Wii yeah, and, and yeah, when yeah. you know when Instagram improved uh, on, <laughs> on the quality of my selfies. You know that's gonna be old school memories for you guys. That's that's fucking sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Bam! What he said. You I mean, know when I Katy can... Perry came and rocked that dress, you know, and everybody was <laughs> filming it. That was. Uh, remember that like no other my phone was working the battery wasn't flat yeah what I, what I gotta say about um, like old school new school though uh, I mean you can also kind of like compare it uh, with movies because I feel like mm -hmm. certain old school shit because when I was listening to the ghetto boys last night with skits I was like damn just listen to that quality like you know it's underground it's filthy but at the same time it feels really thick and warm it's like you know it's like some tape cassette quality and I think, you know, yeah, like, yeah. the same with movies. Like, sometimes the new shit is just a little too clean. Yeah. Just a little too, you know, it's fancy and a little high. too shiny. And, like, same with the movies. Like, I love 80s and 70s movies, you know, like the horror movies and shit. The way they did the practical effects and shit. It's, like, it's done so well. And the, the, the quality of the camera and shit has got a certain, like, rugged touch to it. You just can't, like, duplicate that shit. Unless you're Quentin Tarantino and you make something like Death Proof, but... Yeah, that's dope, too. You know too. what I mean, yeah, though? Like, the, yeah. How those styles get paid homage to as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see kind of like that shit coming back, which is very dope, too. I, I like that also in the hip-hop videos when you look at, you know, like, yeah, let's say Ace of Rocky or Tyler, the Creator, or a lot of these mm -hmm. cats, even yeah, even the Futures yeah. and, the, and the even the designers and shit, everybody's... And, and Travis Scott and shit, it's all got this kind of vintage, grizzly, mm -hmm. grainy, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah like, a, vin like, a vintage like say, feel to it, you know, it's, it's bringing this classy shit. old yeah. schoolness back, and yeah. I love that that's happening in hip hop as well, yeah, apart from what you said, dudes like Tarantino doing that with movies mm -hmm. too, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, old school, new school. Well, first of all, there's a, there's a tour coming up November in Russia, Russia, right? Yeah, 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 yeah we got 11 and shows. September is going to be the U.S., right? Yep, yep, yep. yep. So Thanks. U.S. Ooh. Russia tour for shotguns in hell, motherfucker. All over the globe. Yep. Yeah, it's fucking crazy, man. I fucking love the album and how it turned out. Yep. Uh, can't wait to get on tour and rock the album with them, you know? Yeah, we, We've been doing the, show, uh, the tracks now with, in our set, you know? And they fucking bang all yeah, the Yeah, right. there's a great reception yeah. to it too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's just crazy, I mean, you know, doing a whole album with the legends, uh, Onyx. I mean, that was one of the uh, hip-hop uh, crews that Skits introduced me to. And way back then, I was like, damn, what the fuck? Like, these niggas got the craziest style ever. Like, you know, it's like that, that hooligan shit. Mm -hmm. We'll call it some hooligan shit in Europe. And, you know, like, we always been, like, orientated towards this more rugged sound and shit hip-hop hooligans and and i mean you know like once we started to roll in the game and we actually met onyx and started to hook up with them it was just unreal to me and it still feels unreal to this day like you know we got a whole album we made with onyx yeah word it's yeah. like the perfect combination that shit's like still the gotta new, set in the new hip-hop hip hooligans mixed with the old ones and you know it's just a fucking honor man and i can't wait to get this fucking tour started yeah, all motherfuckers get ready for some crazy ass shit. Yeah, man, I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see what the fans feel about it, man. Mm -hmm. I hope y'all's enjoying it. Like I said in one of the questions earlier, I compared it, you know, to, to um, I'm not sure if that's when the camera fucked up. My explanation was better than, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, nah, that's what we tried to do with this album. We, 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 you know, we threw a little bit of that classic dope DOD sound in there with shit like Pyro 
and uh, you know, um, let's say uh, the, the the atmosphere of psychopath, two beats production, you know, and uh, and and then we brought that onyx, you know, atmosphere on spitting your face and, and yeah, triple yeah. X and shit, and then exactly in the mix, you know, there's there's some some more new school elements in there too, but you know, it's it's just one straight fucking journey through hell. The title couldn't be better. <laughs> it's inferno in forty minutes. So. Um, yeah, man, it's, uh, I've said this before, I feel it's our best work yet, and uh, I'm fucking proud of this shit, man. 100 mad all the way, baby. Oh, that's a beautiful How story. we met Onyx and how? How the collaboration started. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, the story's been told a million times, but we'll do it quickly then. You know, we, we, uh... Well, it's actually, you know what, I'll, I'll throw some more in there. I might have told this in other interviews too, but the funny thing is the very first time I met Onyx was here in our hometown way before we blew up, like maybe two years before that. And um, they were performing at a festival. It's an urban music festival called uh, New Attraction uh, somewhere on the outskirts of town. Everybody, you know, that fucks with rap, with all that, the whole culture, everybody's out there graffitiing, dancing. All up in the videos, you know, he didn't, might even be there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Onyx was in the house, and a, and a homie of mine at the time, Sugar Kane, Dutch rap legend that I met through Vinyl Frontiers, homies from our hometown as well, uh, great producer duo, uh, Doc Fraud and Pinto. They would hook me up early when I was the eager cat knocking on studio doors and shit, you know, trying to get in somewhere and, and, and trying to show my face. Uh, so, through that whole, uh, you know, relation, I got backstage at the festival and got an opportunity to uh, say peace to Fredro and Sticky. And at the time, I already had my hair, I had my lens, I had that shit. So it's it's funny for me, I, I crept up to them and Sticky was sipping his classic Hennessy. Fredro was just, you know, conversating. And I remember creeping up on Dro first, like just bussing lines from purse snatches. <laughs> Criminators and parole violators, a rate of regulators, passive procrastinators, and it's a very complex verse, you know. So, Fred was like tapping Sticky, like, Yo, Stick, this nigga, no purse snatches. <laughs> and Sticky turns around, he's like, What up, Two Face? And you know, I'm just, of course, I'm the, I'm the loud mouth youngster, just happy to be able to talk to him. So, I'm like, Yeah, what up? I'm from Dope DB, it's an honor, y'all's performing in our hometown. I just wanted to say peace. And then I was out again, so. About three years later, we're touring, doing our branded tour, and then going all you know all over fucking Europe and shit. And uh, basically, already in the, in the back of our minds, we're thinking for collabos for the second album and linking up with new yeah. artists. You know, we we met Red Man through our homeboy Ghost Man, and um, you know all these guys. So we were just actually you know getting in the game and and getting appreciated by everyone, and it was a great thing. And and I was a little tipsy. <laughs> Again, <laughs> running up this time the dro, and it's funny that motherfucker. You still owe me more weed, asshole. <laughs> this motherfucker asked me, "Yo, you got some weed?" So I pop out this, you know, little stash that I had. Of course, like, yo, I'm willing to share with the big dog, and he pops out an even bigger bag next to it. He's like, "Yeah, thanks." I'm like, "Well, give me some of that too, then." So, I, you know, I take some of his, and eventually end up conversating with him, and I'm like, "You know, usually I don't do this, but..." I think you guys are fucking sick and uh, we grew up listening to y'all so we would love to work with y'all once and Fredro, because of the dope vibe and just smoking with him, he's initially, you know, he's open to, he's like, who, who are you guys then? I'm like, I'm, I'm from Dope D.O.D. He's like, Dope D.O.D. Ain't y'all the niggas that sound like us? <laughs> so I'm cracking up thinking, oh shit, he, you know, he's heard of us through something or somewhere, you know, we got the buzz going. So yeah, exchange contacts, and uh, the first thing we ever did was Panic Room for the Roach. And you know, if you don't know, then uh, go do your research. There's a lot of uh, shit we did after that, yeah. shows, videos, and eventually an entire album. And now I gotta take a piss, so cut that shit, and we'll do the next question just now. <laughs> hey yo, this gets vicious, and I'm about to show y'all the disadvantage of having a studio in an abandoned squatter building, because the toilet might not be close. But I gotta pee. Follow me. Please.
Easy does it, baby. Well, there's not a specific date or plan for it yet, but uh, we're definitely cool with Dopey, and you know this will be this is the first taste basically of uh, definitely more to come. So. Oh yeah. That's all I can say for now. Well, as someone who's doing everything for you, it's definitely easier, but you have to rely on people to do everything for you and to do it the way you want it. You want them to do it. And that's why we do everything ourselves, because we want to do shit the way we feel like doing it. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, there's two sides to it, basically. I mean, if you get a proper label and a proper team behind you, and of course they will push the shit, you know. I mean, beyond, you know, the connections you, where you can push it yourself. But uh, I mean, you know, um, I think the way we do it definitely as a, uh, I mean, as an upcoming underground band, you know, it's definitely bigger than most underground acts have ever done it actually. Because uh, I mean, we play at major festivals, you know, we do collabs with major artists and. I think a lot of people that do everything by themselves don't reach that type of level of professionality, you know, where you can basically almost be like a label yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotta partially disagree with that because what you just explained is actually the exact explanation as to what, you know, what you can do nowadays as far as being independent and not needing a label. So. Indeed, actually, I see a lot of people say that in the music industry, you know, managers, uh, people that whatever lane they're in, you know, they say like it's stupid to sign to a label unless you need it because a lot of people can create their own buzz and even make their own label nowadays. So, uh, indeed, the advantage of a label will be usually, and it could also be your disadvantage, of course, because, you know, you're going to have to recoup on everything that was invested in. So you might have, you know, it's... It's, it's a given that everything will be pushed anywhere without you having to, you know, pursue it yourself. But then if it flops, you're still going to be in debt to them. And yeah, that, you know, that's the, it comes with a price, basically, if you work with a label and if you work with certain deals. So unless you're going to be able to live up to the deal, if you can do it yourself, you can keep all the money for yourself. So, you know, hence the reason we haven't run into a label yet that, you know match the way we want to do shit, you know. And so what Jay just said, indeed, I mean, and again, I have to partially disagree with it again, because there's so many bands that do it independently and do huge shit like we do, you know. You don't need a label for that. So uh, that's the 50-50 the to that. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, it can be also, it can be kind of dangerous if you don't know exactly what the ins and outs are about, you know, doing your own shit and getting your own money. Cause you know, like, I mean, basically like it happened to Tupac who basically, you know, died still in debt, you know? So, mm. I mean, it can definitely be a dangerous thing. Like a smoke screen almost. Yeah, like a label, <laughs> yeah. you know, that tell you like, yeah, I'm gonna get this shit done for you. Mm. I'm gonna arrange everything here. You got a Bentley, you know? And in the meanwhile, they give you a Bentley, but they also fucking take Five million off you. Yeah, know? and it's tricky too. You know, advice to all up and coming artists: somebody that represents you doesn't necessarily work for your benefit. You know, there can be somebody that, you know, says, "Let me, let me handle this for you, and let me take that little percentage." And as an artist, all you want to do is be on that stage, be you know, get millions of people, for for them to see you. And then in the meantime, you know, so at a certain point, you're scratching your head like, "Wait a minute, where's all this shit going?" <laughs> And that's something you got to be aware of, you know. We've had our own ups and downs in this in this business. Yeah. Funny, a lot of your questions are being asked by the fans. I just took a little peek <laughs> at the at the online questions that we're gonna answer later. Um, well, what usually inspires me are two main things. If I'd keep it short, is is the you know either. Well, it depends on if you start working with a beat that's already partially there, there will be a certain mood. So if I have a selection of beats that I can choose between, that's going to be connected to the mood that I'm in. So my mood will automatically 
you know, kind of pushed me in a direction whether I want to do something more slow or fast or more laid back or more aggressive, you know, that depends on the mood and on the beat. And then maybe another aspect could be if, if, if you sit down and actually make something completely from scratch, that could depend on the mood of both you and the producer. And you say like, what if we take this direction? I kind of want to, you know, do something bluesy or I want to do something dubstepy, whatever the fuck it may be, you know, but it's moods. That's, that's what inspires me to create a track. Very simple. Yeah. And I, and I think, um, Especially when me and Skits uh, in the early days got started, you know, making our own beats and shit. Uh, that really, you know, kind of like put the foundation to the dope DOD sound that's here today. And I think a lot of producers that actually, um, you know, produced our sound later on in our career um, were also kind of like inspired by the shit we did. I think that was uh, a big part of the, uh, of the influence for the whole sound. Cause people just heard our shit that we made independently and they were like damn like this is yeah. something else like i gotta fuck with this shit yeah mm -hmm. that's why i always think it's dope when when uh whoever we almost work you know it's, it's like a lot of the producers they always kind of fit together yeah whether it's more mbc whether it's more digital you know there's and fans when 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 they have when you see discussions you know in the comments like what is this music how do I, you know and, and people will say shut up it's not this it's not that it's dope dod yeah. and i think it's a great honor for people to to say that you you know you've got a sound that is signature to your own can't put it in a box yeah about 5 minutes <laughs> album done <laughs> You go into that time freezing Dragon Ball chamber. <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> took know, fifty you, years in five minutes. <laughs> I think if you got the right flow going, you can make one song in approximately a couple of hours. Um, I mean, it depends on the vibe as well. I mean, sometimes you just gotta craft a little bit more. You know, you gotta put a little bit more effort into it. But sometimes it just fucking flows out. It just pours out. You can basically, I mean, I mean, sometimes I just do like a hook or something. I start out with a hook and a beat, and then as soon as I got the hook laid down, the verse is like, you know, just a matter of minutes, actually. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes you a couple of days to get that, you know, to get that right 16 bars or something. Yeah, um, yeah. I think, I think uh, a track as a whole, indeed, we've built tracks that were close to being completed within a day if you're yeah. if you're really in a yeah, yeah, yeah. you like know you a, sit down with chips in the studio exactly. you work on the beat together yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah i mean you need a producer yeah. that's able to do that too exactly. you know some producers they they prefer to give you a little you know draft of something and you drop your shit on it and you might you know in two weeks once the producer sat down and figured his part out but i like to do shit on the spot you know you can it's it's, it's the most creative you can say like all right shit i need a little sample of this or uh, can you add that bass there? And it's it's yeah, it's it's beautiful. It's a, it's a quick process creating a proper rap track if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah. Um. Well, so I think you need um. You need some sort of uh, you know, a draft of where you want to go, where you want to take it. And I think it's a mix of you know something that's kind of like made. You know, on the spot, something that you just feel, you know, you just got a vibe to it. It's got to grow naturally. But at the same time, you need to know where you want to go. So I think mostly we work like that. Mostly we knew like, okay, this is going to be our style. We're going to do something, you know, something dark or something, something that's, you know, straight up rugged roar, like some 90s hip hop. But then you, as you go along, you know, in the process, you just see... You know, what comes out, what you want to do, what, what what feels right, you know? You can't just fucking make a whole plan for an album like, I'm going to do a track like this, I'm going to do a track like that. I think you got to just, you know, uh, let it grow a little bit and just uh, go with the vibes. Yeah, I, th I think um, as far as, you know, what you, what you asked as far as, um, you know, whether you have it all mapped out, I think especially as, as, as a theme or a title uh, that usually, like you said, you, you first get into making a couple tracks and then usually with a dope DOD project, we will uh, somewhere close to halfway, we'll be like, okay, this, this might be a dope title or this might 
be a dope entire direction. So whatever, you know, miscellaneous shit you may will fall into place with a bigger picture. But, you know, usually we do like, you know, figuring out a certain subject or title that yeah, we're also yeah, going to yeah, refer yeah, to yeah. eventually exactly. in the project, you know? Like the road show. That, that, exactly, that yeah. yeah. So it's it's indeed, as Reap said, it's it's partly just getting into it and finding out I, what what do we work, you know, what's the flavor we, we like fucking with right now. And then somewhere in the middle where we find the title and the, and the entire theme that's going to, you know, embody that. Yeah. Hey, yo, this is Dope D.O.D. from G-Town. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yo, this is. <laughs> Get it together. <clears throat> hey, yo, this is Dope Dod live from G Town. Oh yeah, we want to give a shout out to Lion Events and Lion Wear. That's right, Good baby. Up. 2017. Yes. Hey, yo, we in the Jungle Dynamite studio right now. Homies have just arrived. Got my man Butch in the cut right here. Butch, show it up to the people. Slow down, Butch, up in this motherfucker, the fourth gatekeeper. You can't sit with us, motherfucker. Let That's us right. Be. The we got right here. Dutch rapper and homie, long time yeah, yeah. friend of ours. We got Mr. Oh, Main and Andres Fouché in the cut. What's up? What we got Lucy Dave right here. Y'all know how we do. Diggles and Civil Unrest is about to show y'all some of that production they work it on. Let's go. Jungle Dynamite, boy. They made a little beat, run a little freestyle later on. More to come, yo. Jungle Dynamite, we're gonna call this thing right here, we call it the Relic for now. You're gonna hear some dope first on the shit right about. Sit with us. 
I'm the illest living artist, don't get me started Mess with Biggity, but you motherfucking taught it But it brings well harder than concrete Nick, you ain't nothing but a pussy ass punk bitch One, two, three, four, five, six You better move or die quick I'm truly violent, responsible For the sound of sirens, striking in the head for the high kick The way we bleeding out of block, I'm smiling I'll be sipping in blood psychotic You can scream like a motherfucking dying chick You can slim me, shock for the sound vibing Rhyming, prime timing, right through my minds You niggas are spineless the message I bring be oh so timeless Whose poems and flows be the finest Whose bros and hoes be the grimiest So how the fuck you wanna fight this Don't even bother, punk, better go home You won't survive it tonight You definitely gonna cry, bitch My friend definitely call you and your peers Leave you with your fucking eyes, peers Those motherfuckers What? Yo What? Let's get it what? Keep deep till I die Shut your mouth when I preach I murder thousands of beats Shake the ground when I speak Bodies found on the beach Decomposing a smelly Hanging bones in my pantry Cooking cannibal candy The man with the flow that stretches Leaving my stretches messed up Ain't no heads up, then your head's off When the guillotine drops, guess what? I got a sock with the crack rock in it Stole a phone and a laptop with it Throw a bone and a mad dog in it In a zone with my ass locked in it no one to save me while I'm full and deeper I'm painting a picture as vivid as Giga A whip with a brush and a whip with the ether I'm spitting their guts Oh shit! I'm off, grabbing my nuts Kicking your slut out after I bust Could not flop if I tried D.O.D. till I die What? Let's get it What? Dope D.O.D. What? Alright, Biggie Butch in the house Let's get that cue right Next round Hey Yeah yeah, Butch, that was the light in our rig going, yeah. man. Searching that note there. Yeah. Yeah, I missed the die. I missed the man queue up. Yeah, that's all.